Oh God. Now let us share the screen. Please mute yourself. Please mute uh. yourself. There is some noise. Uh, this is where from we are exactly starting today, but uh, I would like to go back. Uh, not take me much time. Not that I have to explain anything. It's just a kind of a revision because some of my friends missed a few things, were not able. One of them had a problem. One of them was not keeping well. One of them had a mother-in-law to be carried to the hospital. I would just rush through it without explaining anything and tell them this is all that we did yesterday. So for friends who were not with us, we started from here yesterday. Are you able to hear me? Am I audible, Laro Yes, yes, sir. You're audible. Uh, audible. That's right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. We started from here and we said we are trying to provide guidance to the school administration and management. Uh, it's for them to check whatever we are saying, verify it, authenticate it, and then follow it if necessary. We discussed the present scenario and we found out that these were the most obvious things in the present scenario. Uh, then we listed down the stakeholders whose responsibility we had to keep in mind. Then we talked of the three challenges, the skill, scale, and the speed. Then we discussed the new normals uh, the learning being very nebulous, the variables changing, the concern for safety increasing, uh, gap between the expectant skills and the existing skills, and the transformational life skills uh, that's undergoing in them. And we also thought of the new possible normals in terms of our school time, school population, school attendance, school health, methodology, assessment, co-curricular, relationship system, and even the new meaning that could be given to education and we could come up with new definitions of education soon. Uh, the basic things that we decided that we needed and I told you very frankly, I had to invert this whole pyramid. I would have as a, as a professional who has worked in quality for some time, I should have started with vision and leadership, but I started with awareness and exposure, understanding, delegation, teamwork, SOPs, mentoring and monitoring reporting systems and then leadership and vision. Then I said that we have four main things that we have to be very cautious about. Infrastructure, health and safe hygiene, teaching aids and surveillance. I said the infrastructure has transportation entrance corridors and so on. One second, one second please. Yes, Bitya. Better there are two people there at the gate allowing you to enter, so I can't help. Sir, there is a Neeraj Manipal trying to enter. Please help her. Sir, it will be done, sir. Come. All right. So in health and hygiene, we have to take care of the toilets, uh, the sanitation of the toilets, the drinking water, the sanitization of the whole school, the food hygiene, the medical surveillance. And that similarly, in the teaching learning process, which is much extended now, and then the surveillance by the teacher, by the school doctor, and by the principal. Then we had a video, and after that we talked of transport, the school entrance, uh, what kind of precautions do we need to take in the corridors, uh, what kind of classroom seating arrangement do we make, uh, how will we conduct an assembly now, and uh, do we allow children to assemble at a place, or because more than 20 may not be allowed, and what are the miscellaneous things, vis -a -vis especially the support staff, and uh, the mopping and the washing of hands. Then we started with classroom teaching as the provision of a safety kit and certain other things, necessities. Uh, then checking of notebooks, which is to be done after having them covered with plastic. And then at the last point, if you look at point number seven, this was a circular that came to us from the Central Board of Secondary Education. You all have got it, you might have forgotten it but it came somewhere after the 22nd of March, 
that whatever teaching happens in CBSE affiliated schools, that should bear in mind the minimum learning outcomes developed by the NCRT and all our teaching should be either competency based or experiential learning or project based learning. The idea was that there are different topics which are amenable to different methodologies. Some may be amenable to one kind of an approach, others may not be. So they wanted us to follow these approaches and we talked of what minimum learning outcomes are, what competency education based education is, a video on that. We talked of what is pedagogy, trying to distinguish it from curriculum or syllabi. We talked of the difference between the two, the curriculum. Then we took up the project-based learning. Then we gave a rough idea of blended and traditional learning. I have yet to answer a question asked by one of my colleagues here, who is the principal of Aspen Scott School, that if I could delve a little deeper into blended learning, I have prepared a slide and I may explain it provided I get time, but that will come at the end. Uh, then what are the continuity, educational continuity plans? Are we ready to go ahead? Will we continue with the online mode or have both face and face and online combined? And now we come to today. But before we come to today, I would like to answer a question which Nirja had asked me. And you asked me in the chat, what was the question, Nirja? Nirja you, Chatley. Yes, yes, yes sir. Please, I was please ask the question. Yes, because sir, I, I'll begin with that question today. Okay, yes. sir. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. I asked you a question to delve a little more um, the, within the blended learning and the hybrid learning. That's right. Lovely. Lovely. Uh, you see, when you asked me about hybrid learning yesterday, you had not asked me both. You had asked me the difference between the two. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. These two words are today being used interchangeably and nobody is going to take us to the court or catch us if we use them interchangeably no harm but as an educator as an educationist one who has studied education and that has been his life i would say that they are two entirely different processes you understand the word hybrid do you do you understand that do you have a, a clear concept for example, I think the car that you are driving is a petrol driven car or is it uh, on CNG? We have cars in India that are driven yes. either on CNG oh, or on we, petrol. Yes, we yeah. have hybrid cars also. Oh, now which have hybrid cars. Yeah. Lovely. Yes. So you understand the meaning of hybrid cars. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I have seen in the army, uh, they use mules to carry a lot of load, especially mm -hmm. in the mountainous terrains. And a mule is a hybrid between a horse and a donkey. Absolutely. You can have certain hybrid plants also. Mm -hmm. Now, hybrid teaching is simply a combination of online and offline teaching. Okay. If you have some classes which you conduct online and mm -hmm. some classes that you conduct online, when I use the word classes, I mean some lessons of the same class, some mm -hmm. chapters. We will call this teaching as hybrid teaching. It's not blended teaching. Mm -hmm. Blended is a totally different concept. Blended takes into account the differentiation among the learners. Mm -hmm. And blended has several forms. I'll be today, if I get time, I'll be discussing about the six forms of blended teaching. I may not get time to discuss all the 12 rules of blended teaching. So blended is different. Now what we'll be doing now in our schools will be more of hybrid teaching. Mm -hmm. We'll say Monday we'll teach online and Tuesday we will assess that offline. Mm -hmm. Wednesday we will teach again online and Thursday we'll do question answer session and a little explanation offline. That is how that will be known as hybrid teach. Uh, I started with her. I would take you to now another form of teaching which is called experiential teaching. I'm still waiting for a few friends. We are only 178 is yet another 10, 20 friends are joining. Uh, let's go for this uh, watch it. Experiential learning is the process of learning through experience and is more specifically defined as learning through reflection on doing. Hands-on learning is a form of experiential learning, but does not necessarily involve students reflecting on their product. 
Experiential learning is distinct from rote or didactic learning, in which the learner plays a comparatively passive role. It is related to, but not synonymous with other forms of active learning such as action learning, adventure learning, free choice learning, cooperative learning, and service learning. Experiential learning is often used synonymously with the term experiential education, but while experiential education is a broader philosophy of education, experiential learning considers the individual learning process. As such, compared to experiential education, experiential learning is concerned with more concrete issues related to the learner and the learning context. The general concept of learning through experience is ancient. Around 350 BCE, Aristotle wrote in the Nicomachean Ethics for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. But as an articulated educational approach, experiential learning is of much more recent vintage. Beginning in the 1970s, David A. Kolb helped to develop the modern theory of experiential learning, drawing heavily on the work of John Dewey, Kurt Lewin, and Jean Piaget. Experiential learning requires self-initiative, an intention to learn and an active phase of learning. Kolb's cycle of experiential learning can be used as a framework for considering the different stages involved. Jennifer A. Moon has elaborated on this cycle to argue that experiential learning is most effective when it involves 1. A reflective learning phase 2. A phase of learning resulting from the actions inherent to experiential learning and 3. A further phase of learning from feedback. This process of learning can result in changes in judgment, feeling or skills for the individual and can provide direction for the making of judgments as a guide to choice and action. Most educators understand the important role experience plays in the learning process. The role of emotion and feelings in learning from experience has been recognized as an important part of experiential learning. While those factors may improve the likelihood of experiential learning occurring, it can occur without them. Rather, what is vital in experiential learning is that the individual is encouraged to directly involve themselves in the experience and then to reflect on their experiences using analytic skills, in order that they gain a better understanding of the new knowledge and retain the information for a longer time. Reflection is a crucial part of the experiential learning process, and like experiential learning itself, it can be facilitated or independent. Dewey wrote that successive portions of reflective thought grow out of one another and support one another creating a scaffold for further learning, and allowing for further experiences and reflection. This reinforces the fact that experiential learning and reflective learning are iterative processes, and the learning builds and develops with further reflection and experience. Facilitation of experiential learning and reflection is challenging, but a skilled facilitator, asking the right questions and guiding reflective conversation before, during, and after an experience, can help open a gateway to powerful new thinking and learning. Jacobson and Ruddy, building on Kolb's four-stage experiential learning model and Pfeiffer and Jones's five-stage experiential learning cycle, took these theoretical frameworks and created a simple, practical questioning model for facilitators to use in promoting critical reflection in experiential learning. Their five questions model is as follows. Did you notice? Why did that happen? Does that happen in life? Why does that happen? How can you use that? These questions are posed by the facilitator after an experience, and gradually lead the group towards the critical reflection on their experience, and an understanding of how they can apply the learning to their own life. Although the questions are simple, they allow a relatively inexperienced facilitator to apply the theories of Kolb, Pfeiffer, and Jones, and deepen the learning of the group. While it is the learner's experience that is most important to the learning process, it is also important not to forget the wealth of experience a good facilitator also brings to the situation. However, while a facilitator, or teacher, may improve the likelihood of experiential learning occurring, a facilitator is not essential to experiential learning. Rather, the mechanism of experiential learning is a learner's reflection on experiences using analytic skills.
This can occur without the presence of a facilitator, meaning that experiential learning is not defined by the presence of a facilitator. Yet, by considering experiential learning in developing course or program content, it provides an opportunity to develop a framework for adapting varying teaching slash learning techniques into the classroom. I had to use this audiopedia because unfortunately within our society, we have a large number of our friends who do not have that pedagogical background of having studied education at depth. Uh, some of them belong to the fields like English, mathematics, or some of them are corporate trainers and they suddenly start talking about experiential learning and conducting workshops. The result is chaotic. 90% of my teachers in India today, if asked as to what is experiential learning, will tell you it is learning by doing. It is, but it is not. Learning by doing or provision of an experience or a field trip is not experiential learning. You have to go much beyond that. The experiential learning has to be connected with a reflection unless there is thinking involved as to what did I gain out of this experience. And then there is a group work wherein the experience is shared with others. And from the experience, we arrive at a generalization as to what have we learned today? What has this, what has this experience and how has this benefited us today in terms of the conceptual clarity? And then the last stage, how are we going to apply this learned information in future situations other than the existing one? If that is the aspect, then we are doing experiential learning. So my dear friends, when you think of experiential learning, do not think that in your schools, providing materials to the children and asking them to do it with their hands is experiential learning. Taking them on a walk across the banks of a river or outside into the campus of the school is providing them an experience in education, but it's not experiential learn. Instead, if you ask them to perform an experiment and do it on their own, while as you are by the side facilitating the process, not intervening, and then ask them, what did you learn from the experiment? Discuss it with one another. So they are reflecting, the brain is getting involved. After the reflection, if you ask them to sum up in a single sentence of say more, not more than 50 words as to what they learned after going through this activity, they are arriving at the generalization. Now the final stage, where will you use this generalization in life and in other situations? That would be experiential learning. I make it much simpler now with the help of a video. I would like you to be very attentive here because I, I told you a lot of information which really does not belong to experiential learning. I don't know why it has come down to us in India and it's being talked about. You heard Kobe is not the only one who gave us. Even Aristotle spoke about experiential learning. And experiential learning comes from the cognitive domain of psychology. So you have Jean Piaget, the founder of the Geneva School from Switzerland, the cognitive psychologist who gave us these ideas. But then these ideas were clubbed together by Koch and he gave us a cycle. He gave us the five stages or the four stages sometimes of experiential learning. I'll come to this video now. <laughs> This is the Humber Center for Teaching and Learning How To, the experiential learning model. Aristotle said that for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. It was true then and is true now. Experiential learning, put simply, is learning by doing. Following the experiential learning model when designing instruction can help maximize our learners' understanding of important concepts. The experiential learning model consists of first doing, then reflecting on it, then applying what was learned to another situation. Then we repeat the cycle each time adding difficulty or refining our skills. The experiential learning model consists of a five-step cycle. Here it is right here. Step one, experience. Experience the activity. This is learning by doing after all. Have your learner perform a task. Step two, share. Share the results, describe the experience. 
Get your learners thinking about and talking about the results, the reactions, and sharing this publicly. Step three, the process. This is where you examine how the learning process works. Have your learners examine and discuss and analyze the experience and then reflect on it. Step four, generalize. Your learners need to be able to connect this experience to other real world examples. Step five, apply. Now your learners should be able to take what they learned from this experience and apply it to a similar or different situation. And when we apply something to a new situation, we get to experience the activity all over again. We find ourselves back at step one and the experiential learning cycle repeats itself. Experience, share, process, generalize, apply. It really works. Try it today. Get your learners doing, reflecting, applying, and then doing again. Thanks, and if you'd like to learn more, stop by Humber Center for Teaching and Learning. I would like you to look at this David Cobb's model. I have put it in four, uh, I mean, rectangles. The experience is the first part, and this is the only part which we regard as learning by doing. Providing the children with an opportunity to experience the activity on their own doing things with their own hands, learning while they are on the job. But then this experience has to lead to critical reflection or it has to lead to active experimentation. It's a, it's a cycle. Everything gets connected with everything. Once the children get together and start critically reflecting on the assignment given to them, on the, reflection, on the activity that was performed by them, they are able to conceptualize things in an abstract form. They are able to generalize things in the form of not sensations, but in the form of perceptions and abstract concepts. And then they use these three, the experience, the reflection of the experience, the concept formation or the abstract concept formation to act to experimentation in a different situation. And this is where learning begins actually in the brain. So four things that were, I mean, stated as important by them that learning is to be viewed as a process. You cannot view it only in terms of the learning outcomes. Learning outcomes is more from the behavioristic school. It's from the Skinner school of thought. It's from the Pavlo school of thought. It's from the Hull school of thought because they believed that there was an individual who once provided with a stimuli would respond to it. And then we added the organism in between a stimuli affecting an organism and he responding as a consequence. So behavior and learning became atomistic. But Cobb's model does not view learning as atomistic. He views it as holistic. So herein we come to those experiments of Kafka, Kohler, who talked of viewing the whole rather than looking at behavior in an atomistic perception. And then they said that learning is a continuous process which is basically based upon our experience. This is the influence of John Dewey on this cycle because John Dewey's definition of education was that the sum total of all experiences of life is education. And ultimately he switched over and he said, education is life itself. All experiences, reconstruction of experience is education. And then learning is a holistic adaptation. You don't adapt to learning in small responses one at a time. You have an overview of the whole environment and then you take a decision as to what you have learned from it. And learning involves a kind of an interaction between a person and the environment in which he is working. So if two of us are put in two different environments, my learning may be entirely different from yours. I changed this uh, model into a simpler model. Uh, the Andrea Academy compiled it in 2007. It's the simplest model. It begins with do it, do an activity. Engage yourself in an activity. Give the children an activity to perform. Assign it. Make everybody do it. Then ask them, what did you do? What happened? What were the results? And let them discuss it in groups, discuss it with peers, or discuss it with the entire class. So they have done the activity. They have reflected on it now. There has been a discussion and there has been some thinking also. Now ask them, what would you, this is generally essentially what do these results tell you? How are they going to influence the outcome of your doing this activity in future? 
if i ask you to do this activity or another similar activity which would be familiar to it but not absolutely similar to it what would you do so he has done the first part he has done the second introspection part and the mental reflection part he has come to the third part where he says generalization and then he moves further and says now what what will i do differently the next time uh, this is how life also in life also we learn things from various experiences we from the experience we reflect upon the experience we decide what the experience has taught us and then we are cautious of our actions in future uh, that brings us to the next part of our presentation after having given you a brief idea of these methods each one of them needs to be handled in a separate workshop but my purpose was here that since the cbse has told you once you have a general idea you can organize some kind of learning sessions through videos through audios through discussions and your teachers can have a feel of what is uh, what are the minimum learning outcomes what is competency based teaching uh, what is uh, experiential learning what is project based learning so that when they go to the classes they are conscious that which of these methods can be suitable for which particular topic now besides teaching them the academics uh, which is what we have been focusing for the past i would say almost a century even when i was a student my parents wanted me to get marks marks and marks only the time i decided to play a little of cricket uh, i was not provided food for 3 days at a time because i had played for a whole day it was an inter varsity match and i had represented my university in an inter varsity tournament the focus of the parent on getting grades and grades became i mean more and more concentrated competitive as time passed i was a little more focused on my sons and daughters progress in studies than my father was about me and they are more interested now they ask their children to sit down and start reading and tell them look here you know the competition is very tough there are only two places one is for the top another is for the bottom so stay at one of the places anywhere in the middle between 50 and 70 or 80% you have no chance anyway i i don't understand is marks going to be the be all and end all of life are we going to find or do a kind of a survey in our society that children who got good marks who got good grades they made it to best institutions in the country and outside the country have they succeeded in life can success be measured for them in terms of their fame their contribution to society the wealth they acquired are these the yardsticks of success साउंड नहीं है आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही मेरी आवाज नहीं आ रही नो वरी आ रही पूरी आ रही सर पूरी आ रही इलाहाबाद तक आ रही है आपको आ रही है कोई वरी नहीं होता है किसी किसी से मैं इंप्रूव करने की कोशिश करूं ऑडिबल ऑडिबल नो वरी नो व्हाट इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस इज एज आवर चिल्ड्रन कम बैक टू स्कूल वी हैव टू इंपोर्ट वी हैव टू बियर इन माइंड दैट दे हैव बीन विद इन द कंफाइंस ऑफ देयर होम्स फॉर ऑलमोस्ट 3 और 4 मंथ्स वी नो दे विल नॉट कम टू अस बिफोर September or maybe October or maybe it gets further delay. Nobody can predict with certainty as to when they will come to us. Our focus should be on their social and emotional well-being. Uh, a friend of mine in this chat yesterday has written, "Sir, when you talk of this, please add spiritual well-being also." I entirely agree with you, my son. Entirely agree with you. We in Delhi. uh with the help of manish sodia the deputy chief minister and the state uh district or we call it the diet district institute of educational technology or the scert the state council of educational research and training which is a branch of ncert in every state of india they developed a happiness curriculum a lot of research went into this people were sent abroad even he himself went to finland to study their systems and then he created books and a methodology as to what would happiness curriculum be how could we ensure that our children have a joyful learning that they are happy while they are learning learning does not become a, a boring kind of an exercise which is a burden on them no the class environment within the rooms the school environment the smile on the face of the teachers the welcome that the children will be given at the school when they come in the morning and at the same time it it doesn't mean uh, i mean changing the rules of discipline or bringing in 
I mean, uh, a laissez-faire kind of an environment? No, flexibility would be the order of the day. And what kind of activities are discussed in this happiness curriculum? I have drawn out a list for your reference. They wanted some physical exercises to be given to the children during the day, anytime, once or twice. Some schools did it thrice also, which could make them feel happy also. No jokes, please. A joyful exercise is not cutting jokes with them. A joyful exercise would mean physical exercises which brings a little laughter on their faces. It could be breathing exercises, hopping exercises, jumping exercises, putting themselves in a sack and then running a race, holding a, a, a small potato on a, on a spoon and holding it in the mouth and running a race, a tug of war, lot of fun. There should be more of indoor games in these schools. But for us, if we have indoor games now, well, then we will have to sanitize that equipment before another batch of children comes and plays on that equipment. There should be active inquiry. The children should actively get engaged in activities that leads to building up inquiry. Why and how? You heard the five questions in the audio, uh, uh, I mean, in the audio that we play. Active inquiry will mean where the child is actively involved. His muscles are involved, but his brain also is involved. He is thinking, why does it fit into this like this? Why doesn't it fit the other way? So he is able to draw his own analysis of a fact. Then there should be conversation activities between the class, which should be based on reflection. It should not be, hello, how are you? I am fine, how are you? Reflective conversations, conversation on topics wherein everybody is free to express his own opinion. Storytelling, which you are all been doing, and I have found this as a very useful activity, even online. Guided practice for mindfulness. This was why we had a full session by one of my daughters here, Vandana Saxena, and she did explain to more than 400 principals on that day what mindfulness was and how we should go for guided practices of being in the present, not worrying about either the past or the future, and what kind of activity she was doing in her school for this. Lots of group discussions and group activities should be there. Role play and skits should be there. And these should be done on situations. We used to have some nukad nak talks also some years back, but now these could be held in the classes. On certain situations, which could be very close to the social environment or they could be from the text itself. Then there should be presentations made either by individual students, which in senior classes is possible. I saw it about 10 years back in Sanskriti school. I could not find the teacher. She was sitting somewhere along with the children, a young teacher teaching uh, political science class 11th and a child was teaching about Tibet. He had made a presentation and he was telling us, I asked the teacher, have you taught it to them? She said, no, sir. This is the method that I'm following. I gave this as a task to all the children. And now I have told them to get into groups and make a beautiful presentation. One of them will gather the information. The other will convert it into a PPT. The third will design the PPT properly. And then they will choose among the group, the one who is good at communication and good at body language so that he makes the presentation. This child is making the presentation. And I have never seen anywhere in any part of India, even a teacher being capable of doing a better presentation than that on Tibet, on Lhasa. Activities which could be conducted for building up teamwork. They have to realize that all group work is important. I have Mr. Deer here, my Major General Deer here. I used to prefer to work with the Quality Council with ABBA. The reason why Abba Malhotra, I would often choose that she should be my other person or she would choose me. She chose me because I had a little, a little knowledge more than her in terms of educational activities. But I was very happy working with her because she was capable of building teams. She had better understanding of human behavior and she was capable of grouping them together in such a way that we didn't have any kind of a no nonsense activity in any group. So activities where the participants come close to one another, they contribute to one another's knowledge, they contribute of their, out of their own expertise and their teamwork. Now, if these activities are done and they are integrated in the curriculum, your syllabus stays the same, I, I don't suggest that you make changes in that. But rather than teaching it orally, teaching it from a textbook, 
or teaching it through a blackboard and chalk why can't these activities be brought initially you may bring them in smaller doses but as time passes you could increase the percentage of these activities i have shown this in the same way if we look at social and emotional learning they have been calling it cell and there is a proper curriculum for cell a proper instructional method for cell and this method or the whole environment of social and emotional learning focuses number one on your making or being aware of your own self self awareness well this was some years back this was one of the first thinking skills which the cbsc wanted us to develop so once you become aware of your own self you are able to manage yourself better and your quality of will show you a video today on self leadership but self leadership is not possible unless you are self aware for self awareness give yourself a swap test know your strengths once you know your strengths capitalize on them use them keep on adding a few more to your strengths if you know your weaknesses eradicate them see that your weaknesses keep on getting reduced put exercise exercise controls over yourself so you are starting managing yourself then you should be capable of taking decisions and those decisions must not go wrong although in some other workshop i'll say that take a decision at least rather than not taking a decision but here i would focus on do take decisions and assume responsibility for the decision also responsible decision making will only help you in complex problem solving if you are not able to take decisions your problems will never get solved meet the people interconnect with the people get into relationships with the people and become aware of what is happening socially now if you are able to do in your classes make children aware of their own self teach them how to control and manage themselves make them responsible for taking decisions teach them how to combine with other people and then become socially aware of our own society then these are the practices that we are being followed by us worldwide school wide and then the family and community have to be in partnership to go for this cell these things will become more clear to you as i take you to this video let me see what this video has to show us social emotional learning is essential it's the tools that kids need to be resilient to be problem solvers to be good people sel is really about the holistic development of, of young people sel is trying to bring a balance to the individual and what are the personal competencies you need to develop to be successful how do you pull them all together so that kids can relate and navigate the world more effectively the myth was that knowledge was information that could be bolted on to a brain like any other kind of mechanical part. The truth is knowledge is constructive. The truth is all learning is relational. The truth is that emotion drives attention and attention drives learning. Social and emotional learning is about how you do school. It's about what the student experiences, what the student learns, how teachers teach. We can think about schools and classrooms. Uh, out of school time spaces families etc as places where there is an exchange of knowledge knowledge about the world knowledge about yourself and knowledge about the other persons that you're interacting with all of those kinds of experiences i think help form and expose and shape the ways in which young people understand themselves and other people and we start talking about the whole child. Does your child understand self-awareness? Do they understand social runners? Do they make good decisions? Are they responsible? And then we start talking about what that applies to academics and looking at all the essential skills we need them to be successful in life. Children learn when their heart is open, engaged, connected, and filled with purpose. Learning is magical, and through SEL, we can create conditions that allow all kids to access that magic. My request to you all is that uh, as the schools open, you keep this in mind and not only keep it in mind for the uh, for a period of two months two years but it should be incorporated in the entire program day-to-day -day routine so that it becomes a part of your school life uh dr arora ji yes sir should i go ahead or will you take over
सर ये एक्टिविटीज आप करेंगे नेक्स्ट ओह लवली लवली सर राइट सर आई वुड लाइक दैट व्हाट एवर एक्टिविटीज यू हैव इन दिस स्कूल से डिबेटिंग यू माइट बी डूइंग सम लिटरेरी एक्टिविटीज यू माइट बी डूइंग सम कंपटीशंस यू माइट बी हैविंग सम ड्रामेटिक्स यू माइट बी हैविंग सम परफॉर्मिंग और विजुअल आर्ट्स नाउ ऑल दीज एक्टिविटीज शुड बी प्रेफरेबली डन इन द क्लासेस दैट्स माय रिक्वेस्ट टू यू दैट्स अ रिकमेंडेशन दैट हैज कम दैट there should be minimal movement of the children from one class to another from a class to the laboratory from a class to the library this has to be avoided for a couple of months and it is preferred that if these activities are done in the classes in case there are some common areas for example you have a music room or you have a library where one class after another goes maybe during the day two three classes visited then please see that all the points that have been touched by the previous class are disinfected before the new class is allowed to come we don't want a break out in our schools uh, we don't want the epidemic to spread from our schools once again it has happened in three countries of the world it has happened and the schools had to be closed down so please avoid all those activities that lead to or that need or are essential for physical contact of children Uh, which happens in say games like kabaddi a game like kho kho or a game like wrestling or boxing the physical contact has to be totally avoided in case you are having indoor games like carrom and chess or the children play badminton then once these children leave and the other children get into the court or the indoor gymnasium please disinfect the carrom board the carrom pieces the chess the chess pieces and the pawns and everything the badminton rackets and the shuttlecocks and then sanitization has to be done every time the new batch comes in uh, a tedious kind of a task but has to be done yes arora ji i'll come yes, to sir. assessment before that i'm getting you ready yes sir uh, i've been always talking of this but here i brought it once again because many of us are confused as to what is assessment for us assessment means evaluating a child at the end of the term so that his results are declared and he is promoted to the next class well that's not the purpose of assessment look at the second in the middle i treat assessment as a part of learning and i use assessment as learning so what what happens the children get involved in the learning process and they assess themselves also and this gives feedback to the child so sometimes certain worksheets certain activities which look like assessment they can be learning materials and the teacher is able to consolidate the learning the students are able to consolidate their own learning and they are moving towards their goals so assessment and learning can go hand in hand the records of this assessment may be kept by the teacher but these records are not used for any purpose other than learning they are not used for promotion they are not used for evaluation now move to the top one the first one this is what we used to do in cce and what we used to call as formative assessment uh, what do i mean by formative assessment the teacher has taught a unit which comprises two or three lessons or two or three related concepts of a chapter once he has finished this he gives the children a test a short test which may be a 10 minute test to a 30 minute test not more than that it could be a, a worksheet it could be in the form of a question and answer quiz it could be in the form of expression of opinions by the children because the basic purpose of this test is the teacher wants to know am i going in the right direction whatever i have been teaching to the children whatever methodology i have been using whatever strategy i have been following have my children understood and if they have not where are the lacuna where are the errors how do i remedy those errors and if he engages himself into remediation it would be wonderful i'm sad to tell you that it was somewhere in 1970s that i came to the ncrt they were developing a cell for technology and that was the time i saw that they were training their teachers through a procedure known as diagnostic remedial approach diagnostic remedial approach well this was the only advantage cc had which we discarded diagnosing the weaknesses of the learners before it is too late removing them removing the errors so that the obstacles are removed and he can move further along the path before it is too late so this 
formative assessment would happen at the end of two chapters it could happen periodically it could happen at the end of a month at the end of three months whatever it was so that is assessing so that the child does not have any obstructions in the process of his learning and the last one we all have been doing for years now this is assessment of learning whatever the children have learned during a particular course the course was of one year or the course was of two years or the course was of three years now whatever they have learned we have given them some assessments we have maintained some internal record of their progress now they have to pass the course and for this there will be a formal examination conducted either by the board or by the school or by a university that would mean assessment to check what has been learned and what has not been learned we are not bothered now he will be graded now and marks will be allocated to him so you will see the assessment that is required to be done i think the advantages to us in online learning are that we would be assessing both using assessment as learning and using assessment for checking that whatever we are teaching is it really being learned if it is not where do we need to go back i remember i used to commit small mistakes in spellings as a child maybe class 6 and my teacher would not cane me although caning was a very regular process in uh, those days in all kinds of good schools and my teacher would encircle that word in red write the correct spellings of that word at the top and then tell me this has written to be written five times uh, face the wall put the notebook against the wall take a pen in your hand and write each word five times and then when i would go back to him sir i have done it maybe after 10 or 20 minutes he would say now make a list of all these words and write them five times again at your home now he was eradicating my error of spelling mistakes and he was giving me sufficient practice for correcting myself that is what teaching is basically yes sir or ji sir next portion which is very important for all of us to know that is regarding health and hygiene we talked about the infrastructure we talked about uh, um, teaching and learning and this is regarding health and hygiene school is a home for children away from their own home and they are required to be looked after in the same very manner as they are being looked after at home if you want to get your child admitted in a school you would like to visit the school itself and especially when you are wanting the child to be in a boarding house then you would like to not only see the boarding house but also see the mess facilities the school is providing the campus may be wonderful sprawling campus lush green um lush green uh, available uh, lawns they may be attracting but if the kitchen area where you visit you see few cockroaches would you like to have your child admitted there sorry i would never prefer that i would be wanting that the school should take care of the health of the children as the foremost requirement and as such in these moments of covid 19 we need to be more careful about the health keeping in mind that we are talking about the kitchen where the kitchen facilities are in a school maybe day boarding school or maybe as a boarding house for full day for uh, full time living there in the school we should make facility of the infrastructure of the kitchen in such a manner that all the time we could find that uh, everything is cleaned everything is disinfected just like five star facility disinfect all raw materials including vegetable which we purchase for the purpose of uh, cooking if they are to be used uncooked please mind it one thing in this i would like to share with you disinfection does not mean take a sanitizer and That's spray right. it on the spray it on the uh, vegetables which are to be used take care it may be the container it may be the packaging which need to be disinfected before you handle it and when you handle it 
you take away the materials and decontaminate them with the help of the electronic device which is av available these days these items may be kept away from you and untouched for about a time of 3 to 4 hours so that the virus decay is possible if the virus decay is automatic there or is reduced we can surely virus is reduced we can surely consider that yes we are on the right direction to call the student not at one time but to call them at staggered time normally what happens we ring the bell it is quarter to 8 or it is 11:30 or 12 it's lunch time everybody moves towards the school mess and they take seats and everybody is served in one go and in about 20 to 30 minutes everybody leave maybe these days the requirement of social distancing cannot permit it we need to have distance while children are sitting on the table they should be at least at a distance of one and one and a half meter or the new device which we have been able to find out that is that we can put dividers as we put dividers that can help us to have more but we can say that the batches come for their time of eating that is staggered time 11 to 11 30 11 30 to 1 or 2 12 12 to 12 30 like that kitchen staff should observe the hygiene practices they should keep their headgears, they should keep their head covered, their uh, mask all the time, gloves, nothing being touched by them. They keep the food away from their physical touch and give it or serve it to the students. We should keep the cooked food away from the uncooked food so that there is no cross contamination. And we should ensure that if at all our food is being outsourced cooking is being outsourced we are getting cooked food coming from outside from some other uh, kitchen then over there in that kitchen all such instructions which are needed to be followed or guidelines needed to be followed are being followed over there somebody should be there to have a look at it and ensure it social distancing to be maintained, we should complete that eating time at the time when there is a, a rush in the school mess. The supervisors are there, then they are ensuring social distancing. Just like we have supervisors and monitors at the time of examination, we have during the lunch time such in supervisors on duty so that there is no. Um, being uh, no rule being not followed the dividers can surely help us and next we move to the hygiene of the toilets and the bathroom toilets as such as i have visited few schools found that uh, the most neglected area sorry it's not good at all Toilet or bathroom, bathroom we call is another room and should be as good as your drying room. You may say, how could it be? Yes, there should not be any stinking. There should not be any overflow of water. There should not be things lying over there unattended. It should not be as if it's not being cleaned at all. First thing we may just look at that the number should be sufficient. There should be enough complexes where the children can go and ease themselves. And we must make it a point that while entering or being using the urinals, etc., there should be social distancing. All the urinals may not be put to use. In between, the urinals may be crossed or blocked so that social distancing is possible. Running water is available. The problem in a bathroom, sometimes it is stinking because of the water is not available. And sometimes it is because of too much water over there and nobody cleans it. And things are lying over there which stink. 
we are required to keep adequate soap bars, liquid soap, so that washing of hand is possible. And we should also keep in mind that there is material good enough for drying your hand after use. Means there should be towels, hand towels, or not, not the cloth towels, but paper towels, hand dryers, and materials which are required for the maybe air dryers, we can make use of these so that we can keep ourselves fit. Uh, the toilet pot, the commode, the lid, the floor, the shower area, the taps, the hooks, etc. all of them need to be disinfected every now and then, more frequently, maybe every hour. And there should be a checklist there in the bathroom available or washroom available that these things have been done. And somebody as an in charge should visit it and ensure it that the rules are being followed over there. We should avoid washing the children cloth, the cloth like uh, which have been soiled by the smaller children and they should not be washed over there. They should be put in a uh, bag, plastic bag, and handed over to the parents. The material with which we mop the floor, or the material, or the cloth, etc., which are used in cleaning, they also need to be cleaned later on. And for that purpose, proper disinfection material should be available. And all the um, sanitize all these all the janitor sweepers should be given proper training about it. The sweeper should be called and asked that yes, you are the most important person. You take care of the health. Our investment in providing them the facilities of the desanitizer or sanitizers as well as to provide them the equipment for the purpose of maintaining cleanliness is an investment in the school health itself. Next we go to the drinking water and other hygiene. Drinking water in every school is the most visited area. All the children once or twice visit this area and it is the basic need of a child that the water is available and they take it. Portable drinking water, proper RO water should be available. If the RO is not installed, it's better that we install it and we make use of it properly. Every hour <coughs> we should uh, um, disinfect or sanitize or clean the water taps. There should be enough water taps that they are not uh, being uh, put to use uh, by being very close to each other and there could be social distancing possible. Mouth contact with the glass, with the, with the taps, taps, is not permissible. There should be proper assigned glasses. Ask the children to bring their glass if they want to. They can bring their bottles which can be filled. The bottle should be named and they should be kept with the children itself. We may have water break in the classroom itself and ask them, okay, during your break period, you may get your water filled in your bottle. Similarly, eating trays and cutlery, etc. They should be allocated to the individuals. Avoid the use of lifts and elevators in case of outbreak. You should not be all rushing towards the lift area or the elevator area. It's better to use the staircase. And don't touch anything, railing, etc. Because we do not know from where we get contaminated, from where we get the virus. We have seen few video clips wherein when we are using the lifts, etc., how do we use the elbows or toothpicks to press a button? 
such sort of information and training may be given to the children. We should keep in mind that the virus lives on different surfaces for different time duration. And we should study that and accordingly touch the things, keeping in mind copper, it stays for four hours, paper, four days, glass, glass, it is four days again, cardboard, 24 hours, wood and cloth, two days. This is what, this is the information which I could collect from the internet. I would like you to just verify it further and then only inform your children also. We move to the next, that is the uh, medical surveillance. Every school as a matter of requirement of affiliation has to have a medical room. It may be called medical room, sick room, infirmary, doctor's room, nurse room, or a sick bay. Wherever the children in the school get little uneasy with respect to their health, they need to rush to that area. Somebody having stomach ache, some slight fever, etc. They are asked to go to the nurse and she will be attending on the individual child. We need to have these arrangements done in a proper manner, meaning thereby infrastructure should be proper, there should be a bed, there should be uh, available a first aid box, or rather more than that first aid. But one thing I would like to share with you, sometimes this first aid box is there, and which is required to be in the buses also. First aid box is there, but that has never been opened. The Dettol bottle which is there kept five years back is still lying there unopened at all because it was not required to be opened. But we need to really visit our first aid box every now and then and replenish the things, change the things. If things are there which have been outdated, expired, they must be replaced and must be given a new shape. The status regarding COVID-19 testing among students staff should be available with the school. Now, when I say status here, meaning thereby, is there anybody who has been tested, tested negative or positive, any member of the staff, any family or in the community where they stay, such information should be readily available so that we corroborate and then take decision whenever they are needed to be. Medical history of the student and the staff. We are required to have the medical checkup of the children once a year and sometimes twice also. Though the information kept over there is regarding height and weight, etc., but also regarding eyesight or hearing or uh, uh, dental requirement. These are there. But as we have this history available, then surely we can better treat the person in case of emergency. The allergy data. Students may be allergic to some of the items which they consume. That data should be made available to the system in the school. Staff and student aware of these symptoms the training should be given to them that this is a small little uh, low type influenza, not to be worried. And here the fever has gone up. When the fever goes 100 point and more, then there is a consideration that there must be some infection in the body which is needing some attention. But if the fever is less than 100, sometimes we may not be that much bothered about it. Whenever there is an outbreak, we must have already assigned jobs to the rapid task team. The rapid task team must include or collaborate the services of the medical officer from the district or from the main hospital available so that with which you are associated so that if at all there is a situation wherein you need emergency action to be taken, you are 
immediately remove, taking the child, taking the individual concern to the hospital for the isolation. If there is need for an isolation room within the school, that may also be arranged for. In case of lack of staff, we must take the help of ASHA worker, they are the health worker, and the Anganwadi workers who are in the rural areas available. That kind of arrangement should also be made. We take Thank it you, up sir. next Thank as self-leadership. I'll, I'll sir. play it, sir. I'll sir, play sir. it. Uh, I would request all of you to please watch it because this may help us to understand what we mean by self-leadership. All of us. Ah, yes, all of us. Good afternoon. Today I want to share with you my leadership utopia. And when I was discussing this with a friend of mine, he was asking, leadership in utopia? Would we even need leadership in utopia? Isn't utopia finally the place and the moment where we can get rid of all of these leaders and live free? Well, I don't know. I think in a utopia, there will be humans, hopefully. And if they're humans, they will hopefully still be social beings as well. And whenever there are social beings, they come together as well and form sometimes groups, sometimes organizations as well. And when there are these organizations, then I think the words of Peter Drucker are true. Only three things happen naturally in organizations. Friction, confusion, and underperformance. <laughs> Therefore, you don't need anything, but everything else requires leadership. So I do think also in Utopia, we should look at a leadership. But the question is, what kind of leadership? Should we look at the hero model of leadership, where the shining star is the ideal person? I don't know. Today I want to explore with you a different kind of leadership. And for this, I want you to do a little thought experiment. Think about the best leader you have ever worked with. Take a couple of seconds. Think about that person. What did he or she do, say, and so on? Now, all of you will have experienced other people, but I would dare to say, I don't think you will have things like, well, you know, the way that person yelled at me in the morning, that was excellent. That was, that was just brilliant, the way, and I wanted always have more. Probably not. Probably that person will have done different things. And I want to explore that together with you. Now, I do think leadership is an interesting thing, and sometimes it's over-glorified, but whenever you, you become a leader, and I and I had the chance to lead small teams, large organizations, non-profit, profit organizations. Whenever you become a leader, you have like a rendezvous with reality. Leadership is a bit like parenting, right? You have all these visions and ideas what you will do, and then you're in the moment. And then what I would call the leadership problem formula kicks in. And probably the people you have thought about just a second ago have mastered this formula. What does that formula look like? Every leader and every of you who has ever been in a leadership position might have faced these challenges. I think every leader faces the leadership problem formula, and that goes TLT times people times power. First one is TLT, which for me stands for too little time. There's just not enough time to do things, and you can't pass it around, oh, somebody will take care of it. No, it's you, and then you need to do something. And what many people then fall back in is what I would call the headless chicken syndrome. They run around and say, oh, no, no, you do that, you do that, you do that, you do that. And that might then not be the greatest leadership. Then comes as well people. All leaders have to deal with people. And for me, I'm always reminded of my very first official leadership position, more than 10 years ago. So I would have my first direct reports, and the first direct report was coming into the room, and I had it all lined up. I had the vision. I had the team spirit. I had the story to tell, basically. And that was a very assertive young gentleman who came to me and said, Lars, that's all nice, but I have a question for you. Actually, I studied the email policy of the company. And you know, I have a motto I live by, and I always include this, and I have this for the past five years, I always include this in my email signature. Can I do this as well in this company? 
And there I was with all my stories and with all my vision and so on. It was like, what? Is that what leadership is all about? So I was studying the manuals for two hours and so on. Finally, we said, okay, yeah, let's go ahead with this one. But everybody who's ever lead will see like, it's not always about the glorious and shiny things. But it's all about the little things, the little discussion that we have to do. The last element is power. And that's an interesting one. There's a very interesting study done at University of Berkeley in 98. And they brought in random students and selected them randomly in groups of three. And from these groups of three, two of them had to do a two-hour assignment. And one of them was randomly assigned to be the supervisor. And then, as social science experiments goes, there was a special twist to it. At half an hour, the researchers then brought in cookies. And of course, it was videotaped. And then they observed what happens, actually, there. They had some hypothesis. And sure enough, the people who were randomly assigned to be supervisors significantly ate more of the cookies, but not only this. They actually left significantly more of the breadcrumbs as well on the table, like, I'm there. And it was very visually measurable. And that just shows, after 30 minutes of random state to higher status, this power thing kicks in. It's something within us in humans, and I think that is also something to be needed to take care of. Now, I do think these are the classic leadership problems that are not very often taken care of, but I think in a utopia, we need to address those. So how do we do that? What is the way out? For this one, I think we need to travel back in time, actually almost 18, 1900 years, to Rome, to a person called Marcus Aurelius. Now, some of you might know Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius is one of the predominant figures of the Stoic school of philosophy. The Stoics, like the Zen of the West, almost. But Marcus Aurelius is interesting for leadership because he was running a little, like, you know, little side business also on the side. He had a little side job in moonlighting. He was, and that's why on the statue, he's also, you see him there on a horse as well. He was at the time as well, on top of being a philosopher, he had the side job of being the emperor of Rome at the time. And the historian William Irvine calls him actually the true beacon of enlightened leadership. He was supposed to be one of the last of the five good kings of Rome. Now Marcus Aurelius, what we know of him, said things like this. The happiness of your life depends on the quality of your thoughts. He said, so act virtuous, use your time well and be cheerful. Then when you drop from life's tree, you will drop like ripe fruit. Now, can you imagine these words being uttered by some of the leaders like Trump and so on today? <laughs> Most likely not really. What did he do? And we know a couple of things that were transmitted from this one. And I think that is a sign for utopia leadership that we can dive into. He was focusing a lot of his time on a field which I would call self-leadership. Leading oneself first before going out and leading others. And I think that, in my leadership challenges, helped me enormously to actually face some of the challenges of the leadership um, formula that I've shared with you. The founder of Visa, D. Hawk, once said, if you want to lead, invest at least 40% of your time in leading yourself first before you go out to others. Now, how do you do that? And what I want to share with you are a couple of strategies that I've tested, that I've worked with, and so on, to really try to see what can we do with that field of self-leadership. The first strategy and the first field of self-leadership that is out there is self-awareness. When you become a leader, it's actually some of the crucial things to be self-aware of yourself, but it's getting more and more difficult. Any of you have ever been a leadership in a leadership position, if you've ever asked, tried to ask for feedback, that's not so easy. Huh? You ask like, hey team, hey group, do you have some feedback? And very often what you encounter is the silence. Like in these ancient Western movies with these dust balls. Oh, come on, some feedback. Oh, brilliant, but everything's fine. And you know, no, that's not right. Well, there, I mean, you're, you're signing the, the, the paycheck, basically. And they're like, mm, oh, no, no, great, brilliant. <laughs> now, there are some ways, on, of course, to learn to ask also for better feedback. But one of the things I think every leader can do is to check that for themselves. And one of the tools that I have is what I would call the character traits check. A character traits check. You can do that on a rainy Sunday and do the following. Ask yourself, for example, what was the worst leader that you ever had? And then think what your face does then with this. This is me reflecting upon this. 
And then go further and ask, like, what did he or she do actually to be such a worse leader? Did he yell or did she yell? Or did he maybe withhold information? When I was doing this exercise, I was like, well, that bad leader, withholding information. And here comes now the trick and this tool. Give yourself a score from one to five for yourself. How good are you, for example, at sharing or withholding information? How bad are you at this one? And for me, that was like, oh, I'm actually not very good at this. So what is my plan to move that up, to become very good at this one? Because we, what we find bad in others we very often resonates also with ourselves. One of the key things to do from time to time. But if you do that, you will see also the vapor trail effect. You do that the next morning, you're fully engaged. But then, like one of these trails at the beginning, it's very sharp. But later on, it goes, whoo, it fades away. And that's why what you can do is a strategy that Marcus Aurelius did every day. And that is self-reflection. Yeah. Taking just a couple of minutes during the day and thinking about the challenges that you have achieved, but also that you are maybe about to have during the day. Marcus Radios was famous for doing that in the night. For me, this five-minute reflection, sometimes I did in the evening, sometimes also in the morning, going to Pan Quotidien, having a quick coffee, and then just opening my black book and just asking a couple of questions. What are the challenges that I'm about to say? How did my leadership go last yesterday? How would the leader I would like to be do and face the challenges that I'm about to face today? Then asking this and putting this answer. And just one or two minutes of those, actually the interesting studies, University of California, just one or two mini minutes of those can help raise your compassion level as well for others and maybe beat that cookie problem that we've talked about easier, uh, earlier as well before. Self-reflection, two to five minutes. And then we come to the last one, and that is self-regulation. You know, you've done your awareness, you've done your reflection, but you still will encounter the moments. You will still encounter the meeting, the, the discussions that you have, where people come in who've promised you, yes, I will do everything, I will have everything ready, and they come in the room and say, and let's talk it like, let's talk what? The report you said was ready. Oh, oh, sorry, I don't have this. And all the other things, the people who challenge you think they should be on your side and you should be on the other side and so on. And all these moments where you, that you will face as a leader, when these moments you think, that, ah, stop doing this, do what I told you now. But this is of course not the best leadership. But how do we do best do that? Self-regulation. And one tool that has helped me enormously is what is called reframing. Reframing it's a simple tool where you think, like, where you have this, this coming up like, ah, I want you to, you know, you stop. And ask yourself for one to two seconds. Well, on a scale from one to 10, how important is that issue right now with 10 being really my life goal, so to speak? Where is that? If it's a 10, well, then you better engage really fully in it. But maybe very often it's more like a two or three and so on. And that reframing, that taking a step back can help you enormously in actually addressing the situation. Small strategies, small things, but what I would encourage you to do is th Think about this when you have a leadership position. Invest this time in self-awareness, self-reflection, self-regulation, and in self-leadership in general before you go out and lead others. Because very often we hear about leadership, like people want to lead others, we want to do everything. But why not start first with leading yourself? I think if we all did this, this will lead to leadership utopia that we can strive for. And I think we can start all by doing now. And hopefully, if you all start doing now, and somebody asks in 10, 20 years, maybe in our utopia, the question, who was the best leader that you've ever worked with? Then maybe they think of you. Thank you. I brought it deliberately at a particular point because surveillance or monitoring is mostly done in our schools. Academically, it's done by our academic coordinators. And sometimes, we have not been able to mentor them correctly. We have to identify people who are self-aware, who are able to regulate themselves, who are able to introspect, reflect. Such people alone can have, go for monitoring and surveillance. Every teacher in the school has to be on the lookout. If there is a young child, is he becoming nagging? Is he irritable? Is he crying? Or if he is an older child, does he have fever? Does he have redness? Please monitor these things. Be, keep your eyes and ears open. And if you find anything like this, there's no need to panic. Just handle the situation quietly and take him to a sick bay or a doctor's room. Get him examined. Talk to his parent. 
will be able to attend to that child. That will show that you care for the child. The children must tell you about their travel history or if they are planning to travel anywhere in India or abroad. Or if any member of their family is about to travel, keep a record of the travel history. You don't need to keep it on a piece of paper. It can be fed into a computer and the record can be available. There are some of our students who are living either in joint families or they are living with their grandparents. There can be some older members in the family. And because these older members usually have some underlying medical issues, therefore such children are more at risk. As the older people are more at risk of catching this disease, similarly the child may be at risk and we must have a list of such students who are living with older members of the family. You must have a database of all the mobile numbers of your parents. Uh, I mean, you don't need to rush for your register, attendance register, start looking for it. It should be available to you at the touch of a finger on your laptop or on the computer. The school system should maintain this. And then you must plan your lessons and prepare your plans and what kind of virtual tools are you using because you are going to have least amount of contact. I have seen in some of the pictures that were released of schools opening <clears throat> in some parts of the world that there was a big desk between the children and the teacher. The teacher also tried to maintain more than six feet distance. He was closer to the board, blackboard or the whiteboard and farther from the children. So you have to minimize your contact and contact between student and student also. Please keep on advising children. It's not one time job. It's a kind of a regular communication between you and the children. Keep on talking to them about what are the various techniques of taking care of themselves. And at the same time, when you advise them on taking care, please keep on building their morale. A word of praise here, a word of uh, admiration there. This can help in building up the morale of the school. And if some students, <coughs> are staying away, are not presenting themselves to the school, you must maintain a record of absenteeism. You could analyze this record at the end of the week. You could see, are some students staying away or are they attending on alternate days or has a particular child been away for more than four days, more than six days? I mean, this record needs analysis at the end. The principal also needs to be very alert in monitoring, even though the, the teachers will be doing all the monitoring. But firstly, I would request, and I have seen that some principals have ordered, I mean, their <laughs> staff members also to download this application. It's a government mandated application, Arogya Setu, which at once tells you how many cases have been identified within 500 meters of where you are living, one kilometer of where you are living, two kilometers of where you are living, you can find how many cases are using this application, how many have gone for the self-awareness test, how many of them have been identified as cases who are at risk. One is COVID cases, another is cases with whom they have come in contact. For example, I know that 500 meters of me, there have been eight cases of COVID-19 for the last 28 days, but there are 869 people who are at risk of catching this infection because they have been in contact with these persons. Now this application should be downloaded. You should keep on updating it and it should be made obligatory for all your staff. If you can go to the level of your students, it would be wonderful. Nothing better than this. This is going to be your e-passport now of your movement and other things. In case the school gets closed again, Supposing there's an outbreak in the city where my school is or where your school is, and tomorrow the government declares that we had opened the schools with a lot of hope, but then unfortunately, we are again closing them down for another 10, 12 days, we'll intimate you. Prepare and have a plan ready for that kind of a closure also. There is a likelihood, as I told you, in three countries of the world it happened. They opened the schools and then they had to close the schools down. This can happen district-wise. This can happen region-wise, state-wise. Now, if it happens at any point of time in your area, you should have a plan ready that we have completed this much in our face-to-face -face teaching. We are again going back to online. A plan where you will work. 
and then you should have a chart ready with you which talks of if there is a disease outbreak which are the turning points which are the routes that the uh, people will follow the children will follow the teachers will follow this is like the disaster management chart wherein we would indicate who would be holding what responsibility for example in all disaster management charts i would ask them who will switch off the electricity in case there is an earthquake or there is a fire who will be responsible for this particular fire extinguisher which i saw outside the principal's room nobody had been given that responsibility perhaps they expected the principal to do it herself or himself now responsibility is to be assigned to people and the chart of these responsibilities along with the directions of movement this should be indicated please see that you appropriately train all your teachers in the online tools that you are teaching i saw that some schools did wonderful job uh, hats off to our teachers who have remarkably adapted themselves to these conditions and these situations but then the schools have been changing they started with google classroom and then they came to microsoft teams they found the microsoft team licenses expert now they have come to zoom and pedelite now this training them on seven tools may lead to lot of pressure on the staff lot of inconveniences this is changing their lesson plans almost every day and they have to get themselves familiarized with that tool also stick to a tool even though it may be expensive a little give them training in that tool or two tools to be to, to the maximum and let them go ahead with it uh, please keep in touch with the authorities within your own district within your own town the education department you should always stay in touch with them you should have your telephone numbers listed everywhere with every teacher the health department and whatever has been happening or is happening or has happened during the day you should be in touch with that that information should be if you have the arogya setu application you will have most of this information but still then you need to have information other than the number of cases and the number of survives cases or deaths uh please digitalize your record so that whenever there is an emergency and you don't need to search for documents and other things your record is available to you and then it is better that you create some campaigns in the society also in the community also which we call as awareness campaigns improving upon their sanitation improving upon how to take care of the elderly how to take care of the young children see these kind of campaigns can be done by the schools then you are doing a service to the society and you will be helping your own school also i come to the brass tacks now now we have a plan ready and we have to open our schools the first thing we must decide is which classes am i going to bring first my suggestion would be if i am running my school i would only call for class 10th and 12th i would go ahead for a week test out everything see everything give training to everybody and then call call 9th and 11th for another 3 or 4 days and then call 6th 7th 8th i wouldn't call the primary at least for another one month after opening of the school and the pre primary i would think of next year but not for the present i am talking of myself and the government has nothing to do with it the government will take its decision and you as principal have to take your own decision make this plan first which children are you going to call first i did inform you that regarding class 10th and 12th the board has already taken a decision it is in discussion with the ncrt they have agreed upon reduction of 33% of the syllabi they have decided that 50% of the questions will be object to mcqs and 50% will be short answer type subject to questions so this 10th and 12th can be prepared for that the rest of the classes can be brought two days four days later the phase reopening should be taken up for the whole school even even the approach for attendance could be staggered for example in the same class say 12th or 10th i have say 50 children in my class i could call the first 25 roll number 1 to 25 on monday wednesday and friday and the other 25 i could call on tuesday thursday and saturday one of the principal suggested to me sir we could call the odd roll numbers on monday wednesday and friday and the even roll numbers on tuesday thursday and saturday this is the suggestion that has come from the ncrt also although it's a recommendation not an implementable suggestion as yet there are somewhere schools that are suggesting that we could call half of the class for one week 
then the other half of the class for full one week there are others who are saying no we'll call half the class on monday tuesday wednesday first three days continuously and then the next three days they'll be working on projects and assignments and online classes now there may be children who have working parents whose guardians are not able to look after them at home because they also are in essential services maybe doctors <coughs> working in the hospitals so prioritize them as to which shift will they attend and how will they come which day will they come perhaps you may have to allow some of them to come for both the days because they have nobody to look after them at home this also you will have to do once you have done that please ensure that all kinds of payments that are to be made to the school by the parents or by any other source you may be receiving some donations you may be receiving some gifts and other things this should be done through bank only i mean all payments through bank only uh, either payable at the bank or payable through internet banking in case you have lot of accommodation available and you can break a class into two or three parts you can have more of staff available with you and if you have that if you have more classrooms if you have more staff available you can have the entire class nobody stops you but there will be they will be taught by different teachers or you can plan a timetable while group a of the same class is being taught social science the group b is being taught science and then the teachers alternate and they shift from one to another of both the classes but it will increase the workload of the teachers please recast your entire budget i told you yesterday that you will have to go become a resource manager also you will have to look for the expenditures that you can defer for some point of time especially purchasing capital assets buying land buying uh, constructing a new building adding a few more classrooms these things can be deferred buying books buying laboratory equipment buying more computers you do need them i don't say you don't need them but for the present they could be deferred the essential expenditures are the month wise expenditures which are recurring say the salary of the staff the sanitization equipment the gloves the masks i mean there will be necessities like this we have to maintain our balance between the inflow of income which will considerably be reduced and the expenditures i have listed five c's here here confidence communicate compassion collaborate community and cash they are becoming very important when we open our schools how are they becoming important i won't explain somebody else will do it in my place Hello, I'm John Quelch, the Seven. Dean of the University of Miami Herbert Business School. I want to share with you my seven C's for coronavirus survival if you're a manager or a leader. Number one is calm. Your folks, your employees, your customers, your suppliers are going to be looking to you as a leader to project a sense of calm through this difficult, uncertain situation. Number two, confidence. You have to be calm, but not still water calm. You have to project confidence that you're going to be able to see this through successfully with the minimum amount of hurt to the company, but also to all of the stakeholders who are relying on your leadership to get them through the uh, difficult uh, days and months ahead. Number three is communication. you have to relentlessly communicate 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 this is to avoid rumors developing that muddy the waters but when you when i'm talking about communication i'm also talking about a strategy for communication you have to have a sense of order in which to communicate decisions and priorities but you also have to have a uh, rapid communication to the entire body of constituents not delays over hours or days or even worse weeks and silence is absolutely the worst possible thing that you can allow to happen because that's when the rumor mill develops so so far we have keep calm project confidence relentlessly communicate number 4 is collaboration you are not going to know all the answers no one expects you to this is a time for you to call on the resources the capabilities of all of your uh, employees all of your team members and bring them together in task forces sub task forces have everyone 
potentially given a role in which they feel they can be contributing to overcoming the uncertainty, overcoming the crisis. Engaging a lot of your employees in this way will also reduce the rumor mill, give confidence to them that they will then project in turn to the people who are relying on them as their managers uh, for direction. So collaboration, teamwork, delving into your organization to find the hidden nuggets, the people who really can step up at this moment, that's gonna be very, very important. Next, I would say community. All of us live in communities. Our factories are in communities. Our colleges and universities are in communities. We are leading by example, not just within our organizations, but within our broader communities. And especially since uh, we're talking here about an infectious virus, it's extremely important that we set a mo an example, we model behaviors that are community friendly and community supportive behaviors. I would say compassion is extremely important at this time. You or I may have a, a, a strong stomach for these kinds of events. We may rise to the occasion uh, if we're fortunate to have a good team around us. But there are many people in our organizations who are depending upon us who are not necessarily that resilient. And they need to be given the compassion to express their concerns in ways that you, know, you or I might not necessarily need to do. So think of someone in your organization who has elderly parents who are in a fragile state of health. They're gonna be doubly concerned about those relatives at this time when the virus is potentially affecting the most vulnerable and uh, medically challenged in our communities. And therefore, if they want time off, if they want to work from home, if they need uh, to uh, have a little bit of space uh, to look after their family members, please consider giving that to them. Compassion at a time of crisis is a very important manifestation of leadership. The most obvious uh, commercial C of the seven C's is cash. Cash is king at a time of crisis, and everything needs to be done to look both short-term and long-term at the financial health of the organization, because after all, all of your employees, suppliers, and customers are depending upon you to lead, not just emotionally, but also prudently with respect to the long-term finances of the organization. <laughs> Whatever you can do to conserve cash uh, is gonna be very important uh, because that's what's gonna uh, determine whether or not your employees are gonna be paid next week. To summarize the seven C's that I've been talking about, number one, stay calm. Number two, project confidence. Number three, Communicate Number four, collaborate. Look out for your teams and work with your team members. Number five, community. We are in a community virus spreading environment. You have to look out for not just yourself, your company, your organization, but the community as well in the messaging that you're sending. Number six is compassion. Be compassionate to those who need uh, that sense of reassurance and understanding at this difficult time. And number seven, cash. Cash is king. The leader has to look out for the financial future, not just the emotional future. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Aroraji, can you hear me? Aroraji, are you here? No worry. No worry. Uh, well, then, you saw that uh, the third important point while Jack Welch was talking to us was communication. He advised us that silence can be more damaging this time because it will start the rumor mill. And he believes that communication has to be repetitive. 
Now I would advise because you have a reopening plan before you reopen the schools or uh, you call your staff one or two days earlier, please have a centralized communication team in your school. Open all channels of communication, which we call as multiple channels. Please have all updates on your school website. Get opinions from all the stakeholders. Give them a page on your website where they can give their feedback. And also for communication with the parents, with the teachers, with the students, have one-to-one -one communication, which is very important. Use your phone. Use your phone more often now. Now, if, you, if I said that you must have a centralized communication team, who should be the members of this team? Those who have a clear understanding of all the school processes. They should be experts in drafting external communication, be it a circular, be it a short message sent on WhatsApp, be it a short Facebook page that you have maintained for the school. They should be experts in their own relevant domains. Uh, normally, for example, I have to do it in my school. I would call one of the best or two of the best language teachers who are good at communication, crisp and clear communication. I would call a few IT teachers also. The two of them would be jointly responsible along with maybe a few others. I may have a health expert also, a biology teacher also, or the physical education teacher also. These four or five people or six people or 10 people would be the centralized communication team and they would approve of all communication that is to be made either on the PA system or through the school website or through a circular or through a pamphlet or through a PPT, whatever the mode of communication is. Now, what will be these channels of communication that you will be using and use all of them, not only one of them. You may say, because I sent you a WhatsApp message, you did not go through that. Send him an email also. You may say, I have not received it. Ask him to check his spam folder. If he has not received it, tweet also, and then retweet also. Use the Facebook page also. Use the Instagram also. Call him. There is no harm. He will tell you, what the hell is this? I got your message. I got your email. I got sight on your Facebook. I sight on your website. I thought I would personally like to hear your sweet voice. So it's better that I must give you a call. Use career service. And if, you, if it is to be done by hand, there can be in-person visits also at times, uh, huh? which I would prefer that they are listening. avoided for the time being. I'm the not listening. website should be very much open up this time in the sense that you must have certain pages dedicated to this kind of information that the parents need. After this, please try to keep the parents busy by giving their satisfaction surveys. Do these surveys both online and offline. If the parents are visiting the reception, ask them. Ask them for, uh, are our majors enough? Are we looking after sanitization, safety, and security of all the children? It's not your child only. Please tell us where we need to uh, improve and maintain a record of it. Do these surveys on phone also. And if this is to be done on phone, it should be done through personal interaction by some senior people, maybe by the principal, by the head, or by the teachers, or by the management members of the school. Stay in touch. My purpose is that every parent must understand that the school and everybody in the school is on his or her toes. The school website should have all these updates. What have you done for increasing the cleanness of the school? What are you doing for sanitization in the school? How are you maintaining social distancing? Send them photographs of children being taught in the classes with social distance being maintained. How are you making the children observe the various precautions that need to be observed? A recording of the announcements that you make. The child should be able to speak about it at his home also, but it should be available on the website. What are the teaching strategies that you have changed? How have you staggered the timings of the school, of the transport, and then what methodology is being used by the teachers now? Are they going following the project-based learning? Are they using competency-based model? Are they using experiential learning? Are they teaching him one day and the second day they are going online? And what are the safety and security measures that you adopted? This whole information should be given. It should be written as pages to update parents on information after COVID. When we reopen the school after COVID, give them this information. You should have 
provision for getting feedback from the school website if you are frequently asked questions are there there should be a page on the website which answers these questions of the parents rather than you being asked these questions off and on request the parents to go to the website and find the answers give him the answer today but for future you refer him to the frequently asked questions please provide all local emergency contact numbers to your parents on your website to your teachers and to everybody all links to external information like the health department the education department the police department their websites their links how they can be approached their phone numbers how they can be reached this also should be available on the school website uh, we are entering an era where there are lots of risks involved how do we manage these risks there is something very interesting related to communication communicating in risk circumstances like coronavirus epidemic requires for us to remember three communication principles the first one is we have to pay attention to objective uh, indicators but for leaders it's not enough to consider only objective information we need to give a lot of information to perceptions perceptions create problems perceptions create crisis so we will be able to handle a situation like this not only looking at numbers but looking at our people our stakeholders understanding them and addressing them in the way they want our efforts shouldn't be dedicated to change public perceptions our main effort should be to change the risks perceptions are based on consider your main priority communicating with your internal stakeholders of course we have to be consistent and talk with the same message to every single stakeholder either be a public authority clients and consumers um, partners local communities but the first stakeholder should be always the internal stakeholders also because they will become the main source of information of what the company is doing there are a few guidelines to communicate in risk situations risks are not taken the same way by everybody so we have to understand that they depend on age on education on experience so a good thing to do in a risk situation is to adapt to your audience to understand the audience and make sure they are, they are connecting another recommendation to communicate in a risk situation is to understand that risks bring fears and fear is a very strong emotion so the more emotional people get the less they will listen to us if we take an approach of uh, addressing any risk from a scientific point of view they will not listen to us so my recommendation would be to be really empathetic which means listen a lot do not react to strong emotions or strong reactions to people and be aware that the more you are calm the calmer the audience will be another element is to understand the risk risks are always linked to two things the first one is familiarity and the second one is control we are not afraid of familiar things even if they are really really dangerous and the risk depends on how much we control that activity so a recommendation would be to implement anything that the audience will think they control the issue in a risk situation the best communication channels are always dialogue conversations this is why when we are facing a risk we we have to make sure not that we are talking but we are listening we need to create channels or platforms in which people can bring over some elements some new facts so it's more a conversation than a top down uh, teaching there is something that never works 
which is silence. What we have to do in such a circumstance is to flow the, with information to our stakeholders. When people don't listen to the company, they are afraid of missing something. This is why it's so important updates, being really proactive, repeating the same message as many times as needed, and make sure we are communicating properly because people think we are giving them enough information. The core of any communication during a risk situation is building trust. Why? Because people know that companies and governments have lied to them. They may trust other sources more than the top management. So we have to build uh, trust. And how we do that? Telling always the truth, never lie to anybody, and to anticipate questions. Preparation is the key element to build trust and not to lie ever. In risk situations, we have to make sure we talk about our expertise. The risk here is that top management speaks about things they don't know or they don't understand. So for company leaders, they have to bring experts to the table and they talk only about what they know. And another best practice in communicating in a risk situation is to make sure you understand that we are in a fluid situation. So don't be overconfident. Being overconfident make intelligent people panic. I would request Watsala, madam, is she here? Watsala, unmute yourself, please. If you are here, I may need you. Uh, there was a question yesterday asked by a friend of mine, sir, how do we persuade the parents to pay fee? <laughs> well, that's a question that was not a part of my presentation, but definitely does come up. And it's a very important question because since the parents are not paying, we are not in a position to maintain the day-to-day -day expenditures or even pay our staff. Even the best of the schools have been deducting certain percentages and then paying salary to a part of the staff and not the other part. And more than 80% schools have not paid their salaries as yet for a couple of months. Now, how do we prepare the parents for the smooth reopening of the schools? I've been talking to a few parents and I have found out, uh, I would say 90% of them are not going to send their children to school, even though the government may declare the schools to have been opened. And you may also call them and say that everything is all right. You can come and pay a visit. They may not. They may hesitate. It may take them some time to build that confidence. They feel we don't mind even if our child loses a year. They have gone to that extent. Uh, well, let us see what we should do. That's where I wanted Watsala. Uh, while talking about parents, the home and the school, she did talk of a sentence that has completely changed my perception also at this age. We always talk of involving parents. She said, let's not use this word involve and involve. Let us engage parents. Well, that changed my perception also. And I thought as a leader, because I am the driver for this change, I must think of the professional capacity that I have and my parents can bring in. I must think of ultimately reaching my classroom, but what are the things that I'll do? My learning has to be student-centered. I have to involve all the parent communities and I have to provide instructional guidance. This is all I need to do for my classroom. So for my classroom as a leader, I am responsible for instructional guidance. Parent community ties will be very important. Student-centered learning has to be, a climate has to be created for that. And I have to build up the professional capacity of the entire organization. But there is something interesting that I see now. I see a challenge. I see an ineffective school and family partnership. There are lack of opportunities, no programs in this school, no programs, no programs for the staff as such, which could enable them to build up some partnership for the capacity. Madam, would you please switch off your audio? Apna band karke, ab kar liye ghar ka kaam bhi saath saath, koi worry nahi. Zaruri hai, hum garu mein hi sab baiche, please. 
lack of opportunities the school has the staff does not have these opportunities where they are given ideas that these could be partnership programs i'll talk of a few examples as i go along even the families do not think of what are the opportunities where we can build up partnerships with the school they look up to the school as a commercial organization and their responsibility according to the parents is to impart education to our children because we are paying them and they must impart us the value for our money now what could be the opportunities that could be possible in terms of processes we have to link every opportunity to the learning either of the child or of the parent or of the school staff it has to be a relational thing it has not to be a dependence one is not the master the other is the servant it has to be more service oriented and leading to development of the parent community the effort has to be collaborative the effort has to be interactive these are the various processes that wherein you can involve the parents the organizational conditions have to be such that across the entire organization they are systemic it has to be integrated in all the programs it's not here the parents can participate here they can in be engaged here they cannot interfere and then it is not a process that has to go on for a month or two and then it's dropped down it has to be sustained sustained if it needs resources sustained if it needs infrastructure it has to be done i'll i'll give you one or two examples uh in gyanbharti school delhi when i was there in 1992 93 we did have a large uh parent body which you call as the Te parent teacher association now and i was able to request them that i have a huge staff of 150 at least 10 percent would mean 15 of them every day going on leave and those days we had more than 15 days of casual leave permissible would you volunteer because some of you have uh, i mean uh, teaching experience but you have given up your job some of you because of your children are not attending to jobs can you come for a day in between maybe once in a month once in six months or twice sometimes in a month when i need you i had 349 applications from mothers and some from professors of the jlnu university also who were fathers who volunteered that we could come for classes whenever you need us and they did not accept any money for almost 6 months i had to take the issue back to the parent teacher community and request them that i would be meeting the conveyance expenses and they developed a rationale on their own that these would be the conveyance expenses for anybody coming to teach between Uh, kg to class 5 this from class 5 to class 8 and this from class 9 to class 12 so i had no problem of leave arrangements in my school one parent cooperation another in pune i saw a school it's a podar international school i saw they would call the entire community parents and tell them how many of you are computer literate especially the mothers how many of you are able to speak in english how many of you would like to be effective speakers of english how, how many of you would learn about the use of technology about internet banking about working with smartphones and they held classes for these mothers after three once the children went back to their homes or the children could go and sit in the hour, an hour for the family so groups of parents would come and be trained i mean you you, you can see how it is a sustained effort i saw in another school in in part of uh, our very country that a body of parents was called and they were told we are going to have a very i mean important function we have come to the celebration of our 50 years of the school and this will be a week long function it has it is to take the shape of a festival and parents were asked to volunteer as to what kind of responsibility would they take i know there were parents who came forward for developing all musical items there were parents who decided that they would write the scripts for all the plays and everything there were parents who did the uh, what we call as dance dramas and all those operas i mean the parents managed the whole show there was another school where the parents were called to give career counseling to the children uh, we had a lawyer coming in we had an is officer coming in we had an army officer coming in we had an engineer coming in he had been a parent he was a parent even today for us an alumni's parent he came in and delivered a lecture to the children that these are the options available to you now this kind of a relationship they built in 
people, then the parents trust the school and the school trusts the parents. Uh, I move a little further. If you want to create a policy and a program, what should be the goals? Uh, I've taken up four C's. Every policy that you have while well, you want to engage your parents, it should help you in building up their and your capabilities. It should improve upon the skills and the knowledge of the parents and the skills and the knowledge of your own community of teachers. It should build in better networks. We don't need to distrust them. We don't need to uh, look upon them with suspicion. And the parents need not be told that we are experts in our own area. Therefore, we know everything. We know nothing. To tell you honestly, I've been more educated sometimes by the parents than what I learned outside from the books. They talked about practices that I needed to put in place, which counseled their children better. And then sometimes we can work on each other's beliefs and values also. This is where the parents can be largely helpful to us. The behavior of the children, their belief system, the respect that they show to their elders, the patriotic feelings that they have for their country, the, the common uh, secular ideas that we have, the common cultural moves that we have. This can be built by the parents as well as by the school. And then it can lead to confidence. Confidence in the parents that they are contributing to the school where his own child is studying and others are being benefited. Confidence of the school that we have a community of parents who are doing everything for us. You'll be surprised, some of you may be knowing it if I tell you. For the past 20 years, the elderly retired parents of Vasant Valley School have been managing the morning and the afternoon traffic. That may surprise you. There are children of a particular school in Delhi, who visit a colony, like a colony in which I live, say 400 families. And in this colony, we have 30 or 40 families of senior citizens, the husband and the wife, living all alone, aged more than 60 or more than 70. Now, they would depute their children and make them sit with these elderly people for at least an hour, run errands for them, get their uh, bank receipts for the pension, whether it has been credited or not buy certain essential items or medicines for them, get them a test which they had undertaken at a lab. Now these children, I tell you, as they grew up, I, I meet some of them, they are now in their 40s and 50s. And as I meet them, I see so much of love and affection for old age in these people. They are lovable to their parents and to their grandparents. Now this relationship has to be built on mutual trust. The school, I'm looking at the right hand side, the families, should be made to play multiple roles, not one particular role, supporting every action of the school, encouraging the teachers, their own children, and the leadership of the school, monitoring, and not monitoring with the purpose of finding defects, monitoring with the purpose of mentoring and guiding. They should be our advocates in the society. We should involve them in our decision-making possible, possible uh, policies and we should all collaborate together. This would be the role of the family. And what would be the role of the school? Please honor and recognize the fund of knowledge that each family has. You are treating them as, I mean, uh, a refuse, not used by the, by the society. Please connect this engagement with student learning, not asking them to monitor the student's homework, not do his homework, not buy him the papers for his projects or get him a project, no. Get them into the classes, make them observe her children are learning. Talk to them about various methodologies and let them also tell you what they feel they learned, how they learned at their own time. We have a vast majority of educated parents now and create a culture in your school where these parents are always welcome. Now this you may say, Professor Andu gave us a philosophical lecture on what parenting is. No, my dear, I'm coming to brass tacks. Please communicate with your parents, make a PowerPoint presentation, develop a poster or an e-circular before the school opens. Give them all the information that you want to communicate with the parents. You may talk to them one, one by one also. You may give it to them on the school website, but give it to them first. Please teach your children through these uh, posters and other pointers what is hygiene? Why is it important? Why do we need to wash hands? And how do we need to do that? Why is social distancing so important? 
Why do we need to wear a mask? I'm glad uh, we have a participant here who is managing a school, is the owner of a school in Varanasi, but is staying in USA. He yesterday has written that wearing mask is a sign indicating that you care for others because the kind of masks we are using are not N95 trailer masks. They are just masks that prevent others from catching our infection. So we are caring for them. If we want to protect ourselves now, then we need to wear N95 masks. He was right. He also has written to me that in some of the practices that you mentioned here, which have been stipulated by the Disaster Management Committee or the Ministry of Human Resource, are not scientific, based on scientific evidence. He's absolutely right. Nothing that we are doing today against COVID or fighting this virus is based on scientific evidence. It's purely based on a kind of an understanding. It's theorization, hypothecation. I mean, as soon as research evidence starts flowing in, more and more scientific data will flow. We may realize that this was a mad practice. It was not helping us in any way. But for the present, because it helped in other countries, we are following these practices. And then please advise the parents that they talk positively about the school. I mean, a parent saying that I won't send you to school. They don't care about you. They will endanger your life and then the life of other people in the community. It is better that the parents are advised that please talk positive. Do not scare them. If you give them conditions, don't do this, don't do this, don't go here, don't touch this, don't touch this. I mean, the child gets secured when he listens to too many do's and too many do not. It's good we tell him what is required to be done, what's not required to be done. These do's and do nots are important, but don't secure him at the same time. The parents should show confidence and we have to build that confidence of the parent that the school is ready. There is no harm before calling the children to school, please for two to three days when the schools are to be opened, three days before that, call your parents. Tell them I would appreciate a visit by you. We have fixed some timings because we are maintaining uh, the, the sanctity of the campus as also the, uh, I mean, cleanliness as also uh, the sanitization of the campus. Therefore, if you could come this class during this hour, this class during this hour, so that you, you, you check them at the gate, all thermal scanners, this is how we'll be checking our children. And somebody could keep on talking on the mic while they are going through. Let them see the arrangements in the classes, in the kitchen, in the toilets, in the play field and the activity. If the parents still say, no, we are fully satisfied with what you have done, but I don't know, I have a sort of a fear, I have a sort of a uh, phobia, I don't want to send my child, don't come tell them. Let them send their child to the school a little later. But please request the parent that talk to the children about the teacher. The child should be able to speak at home the name of the teacher, one who is teaching him, and introduce your teachers to the children and let the teachers themselves also introduce. Please write down my name. I'm writing it here on the blackboard. You call me miss, you call me madam, you call me sir, but my name is so-and-so. Your papa may ask you who was the teacher in the class. Tell him my name. Let the children know their teacher by name. Please do not put any pressure on academics in the very beginning. You can start building up this pressure by and by because ultimately we are very fond of doing that. We won't spare any child. We'll make him score those 90% and above. But bringing this trust on the child at a difficult period may not be advisable. It's a different world. The normals are changing. The lifestyles are changing. He has been uh, living in a different style. Therefore, let us work with him joyfully, build up his social skills, give him a little of music, give him a little of dance, make him do a little of artwork, have some kind of a physical activity for him. Side by side, have some programs for him. I will be mailing to all of you a letter that I received from one of my participants here. She is the vice principal of a school in Jalandhar. She sent me an email, which is a letter from a principal in USA to the parents. That letter speaks volumes about how the new normals will change and how the parent has addressed, uh, how the principal has addressed the parents is a wonderful one. Please advise the children that they do not share food with anybody or water with anybody as a precautionary measure. Even if there is a child without food and they would like to share some food with him, leave it to the teacher, go to the teacher, tell them, please come to me, I'll arrange food for you. I know we have in the classes a system of sharing and caring for each other, but this must not be done in these times. 
then please monitor the child's health. The parents are to be requested to do that. And if they find that the child is sick, he is not 100% fit. It's not necessarily that he is a patient of COVID. He may be having a slight flu. He may be running a little temperature or he may be feeling a little fatigue. Then the child should be kept at home. And good practices, hygiene practices are to be followed everywhere, both at home and inside the school. Please get these undertakings from the parents, but you will have to wait for the government orders in this behalf. Every parent must give us a self-declaration of his travel history. They must understand the quarantine policy of the school and they must write it that I have seen the quarantine policy of the school. I have gone through it that if a child has fever, if a child is coughing, if a child has shortness of breath, the school will quarantine my child and call me and I will pick up the child. And you be also alert. Visual signs of inspection of each child are very important. I said, if the child is having difficulty in breathing, although he has not had any physical activity, that time it can happen. If he is feeling fatigue or if he is having extreme fussiness or if his cheeks are flushed, if he is breathing rapidly, well, these are signs of illness. And then this case needs to be reported to the medical room and ultimately to the parent. The parent should also give an uh, undertaking about the transportation policy of the school and the school program. I know there will be parents who will bring their child. I forgot to send him yesterday, so I'm sending him today. Please put him in the bus. The bus is meant for 30 people or 25 people. We can't accommodate 31. Therefore, it is better that these things are discussed with the parents beforehand. And an undertaking is obtained that you know now the transportation policy, you will follow it. You know now what the school program is, uh, that your child has to come on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so you will follow that. And then the temperature taking policy. Arora ji has explained to you that the thermal scanners are different from temperature taking. The thermal scanner is kept at a distance. It measures which portions of the body are out. Normally, the signs of temperature, which I read in various circulars, Arora ji was kind enough to share with me because I had a doubt that possibly I have been under the belief that 37.6 is the normal temperature of the body, which is 98 degrees centigrade, 98.4. So he said, no, Mr. Andu, it's only 100.4 and 38 degrees where the child is to be declared as running fever. Otherwise, normal fever of a person can vary from morning till evening, during the day and during an activity. Uh, parents should be advised not to bring the child to school if he is running temperature or if we find that the child is running temperature on arrival to the school, then the child will not be allowed to enter the school. He will have to be sent back. Please keep the parents informed about, these are the most important questions that the parents have been asking me. Sir, how will the classes be conducted? Will all the children be there in the class? Will the teacher be before the children in the class? Because the children will go and shake hands with one another. I told them, no, the children will be received by the teacher at the gate of the class. That has been the procedure and that's what we will continue. How will the social distancing be maintained both inside and outside the class? What activities will continue and what activities will be stopped for the time being? What changes will be made in the curriculum of classes 1 to 8 and regarding 9 to 12? They will come to know from the CBSE or you can circulate that circular also. And the academic calendar, which chapters will be focused on? For which chapters have they to prepare for the examination? What will be the assessment pattern that the school will go in for? When will the periodic test be conducted? Some way to test be conducted and the cumulative test at the end of the term or at the end of the year be conducted? And what will be the dates of these examinations? Every communication that is made by the school to the teacher or from the teacher to the school or to the parent should not be done on paper, please. Every communication should be online. Paper should not change hands. A sheet of paper from me to you can mean either you are transmitting the virus to me or I am transmitting the virus to you. Please in, get yourself indemnified. Get the school indemnified. This may be a terrific problem. We'll have to wait for the MHA orders because we would like before opening my school, as the owner of the school, as the principal of the school, for example, I would like to tell the parents that I am opening the school. I have shown you everything. I have made all possible arrangements, but I will not be responsible now. 
I will, you will not sue me for any claims whatsoever because I am following the best practices of social distancing as given by the Ministry of Human Affairs and the guidelines that have come from the disaster management group. So indemnify me. This is a bond that the parents will be required to sign. Now, something interesting. I want that all of us move from survival to celebration. I'm sure we are all going to be alive. Nothing is going to happen to us. Even if unfortunately by any chance we, caught the we catch the virus, we'll defeat it, I promise you. Maybe we are quarantined somewhere for 14 days. We take uh, proper medications and we return home normally. My friends have all done that. Many of my friends have returned back safely. Now, we have survived, but therefore we must celebrate. Hammer and nail policy will not work now. A policy that there is a loophole somewhere and we can fix it with a nail, no. We have to reassemble our lives. The whole process of adaptation will begin now. This is where leadership will be in focus. Earlier, when we were trying to celebrate, survive, we were non-deliberate. We were not in control of anything. But then after that, we started recreating ourselves. We did not start recreations. We start recreating ourselves. It was the new Professor Handu now. It was the new you now. And we started adapting. Please, please, could, I, could you give me 10 minutes more? I don't need more than that. I, I know it's more than two hours now, but I had told you two and a half hours. Recreating and adapting. Adjusting to the new normals, adjusting to the new environment, adjusting to the new world. I am creating a new me. I was not this till yesterday. I am a new man now because I have survived. And therefore, because I have survived, I am now on an auto mode. I am adapting myself to the new normals of the society. I am empowered because I have become wiser how to deal with the crisis now, which earlier I was not. And then... How can I have an opportunity during this crisis for my growth? Can I have that? What do I want to do during the COVID-19? Let me come out of this fear zone first. I have been holding a lot of food at my home. I remember on 22nd of March, uh, 21st of March, I went to the, the big bazaar here in Noida and I purchased uh, rations which have lasted till now. They are not over as yet. An educated person like me also holding food items, toilet paper, medicines. I purchased medicines for three months as if the shop was not going to open ever. I kept on complaining, what the hell is the government doing? From 500, we are becoming 1,000, then 10,000, then 12,000, then 40,000. What's it doing? So I was complaining all the time. And my anger and my fear and my emotions, I was transmitting it to everybody. So I was securing everybody. I was getting angry with everybody. Are bhai sahab, kyun ghoom rahe hai Walk around, sir. Walk aaj zaruri hai. Zara ghar mein baithye. Aap dekhye, mere se aap bade hai age mein do saal. Aapko aur mujhe to zyada khayal rakhna hai aapne aapka. Are why can't this be said politely? Why don't you come down and tell him, sir, may I speak a few words to you? Sir, let us stop taking these walks. We can take it inside our room also, sir. Or if you don't have a facility, can you come to my home and use the treadmill, even though it's not permitted, sir? I would not advise you to be coming to my home. We transmitted this anger and fear and our emotions to others. And whatever messages we got, right or wrong, even Ramdeji's messages that have been coming recently that he has found a cure. Trust me, I must have received a thousand times this message. And I know there is no treatment for a virus. I know it as a student of science. I know viruses cannot be treated. They cannot be killed. We can only build up the immunity systems of our body, inoculate ourselves against a virus so that our antibodies kill him. Treatments do not exist. I mean, I was glad yesterday that one of our ministers of the Delhi cabinet returned home happily because plasma therapy has helped. You'll be surprised. A patient of COVID-19 who went back home, hale and hearty, we requested him for some plasma donation. We took out some antibodies and pumped them into the blood of this education, I mean, health minister of ours, and now he is fit. Oh, we are all experimenting at that experimental stage. Let us please come out of this fear zone. Let us come into the learning zone. 
the second zone it has begun and i am sure many of you are already in this zone i do not compulsively consume things that i do not want whether it's food or news there are people asking other sir aaj kya news thi nahi aaj tak pe to maine suna wahan se ladakh hi aajkal chal raha hai waqai kya news thi kitne patient mare aaj ab yahi news hai main agar kisi se bolta hu maine kaha yes sir we have touched uh, uh, almost 5 lakhs now but the good news is sir that we have sent back home 2 lakh and 80000 ha हाँ सर ढाई लाख से ऊपर ही हम गए हैं जो बिल्कुल ठीक होके घर गए सर बट डेथ्स आई सर सर होता है ऐसे केसेस में क्या होगा डेथ्स उनकी कोरोना से नहीं हो रही है उतनी जितनी उनकी अपनी एलिमेंट से हो रही इफ आई एम हाई ब्लड प्रेशर केस इफ आई एम किडनी फेलियर केस इफ आई एम डायबिटिक केस देन कोरोना विल नॉट किल मी कोरोना विल इम्पैक्ट माई नर्वस सिस्टम माई इम्यून सिस्टम एंड दीज डिजीज विल किल मी बट वी वेंट दी अदर वे आई स्टार्ट लेटिंग गो ऑफ थिंग्स दैट आर आउट ऑफ माई कंट्री See what cannot be controlled. I have not to take care of that. I must let go. I have started understanding that I must not get irritable. I must not get angry. I am trying to understand the situation better by reading, by studying, by going and finding out materials, research-based evidence, and any information that you send to me on WhatsApp, on Facebook, I verify it before I share it. If it's not worth being trusted, I share it with one of my friends, and I tell him, "Sir, you are a doctor." please let me know whether it's to be done i have a principal here she asked me a question about a month back i have not answered that question i will answer it today bitiya you sent me a message asking me sir my school wants to build up a tunnel which would be a screening kind of a tunnel and a sanitization tunnel i told you i do not know the answer i will talk to a doctor Is yes sir right? yes sir it was me yes sir minakshi today i answer yes. today i answer that question it is not safe for the children that's why i didn't answer it my doctors have told me sir this can be put up in a gurudwara which has been done already this can be put up at an airport but for our children exposure to this sodium hypochlorite is damaging and dangerous we should not expose them sometimes too much of sanitary vapor because it's alcohol vapor if it goes into the air it causes lot of problems with the children small children especially if they are asthmatic so i advise you not to do that therefore any information that you share with others see i should have felt happy are my bitiya has asked me a question i should come out with an answer based on my own experience which i have none i have no experience of ever having faced a covid threat therefore i talk to my doctors i discuss it with my friends once we were 100% certain that the information that i am going to give is reliable i gave this information to her i acknowledge that everyone is trying his best we have the covid warriors in the shape of our police personnel we have the covid warriors in the shape of our doctors and our nurses who have not visited their families for months we have our covid warriors in the shape of our teachers who so all right the schools are closed doesn't matter but our learning has not stopped they learned these techniques of getting themselves trained they learned to expose themselves in front of the parents and the entire community open up themselves and i am proud of all of them really proud of all of them that they adapted they did not care because they wanted learning was at stake they knew that the child's growth was at stake now we have come out of the fear zone we are some in the still in the learning zone if somebody is in the fear zone please come out of it as quickly as possible from the learning zone there are many of my friends i am sure there are some of my principals here who are who are here and who are very much interested that they would like to grow out of this because the adversity has also its chances of growth find a purpose in your life how can you help others find that how can you use your skills in the service of ones in need how can you show the empathy how can you live in the present and focus on your future plans how can you keep your emotions to yourself and whenever you go out and meet other friends or talk to others be happy and make them feel happy how will you show gratefulness to god by writing the word gratitude in messages or by expressing this gratitude by raising your hands and saying my god i thank you it's me still alive today and doing some kind of a work which i love to do allow me to do it i find ways <clears throat> to adapt to changes i practice calmness patience relationship and creativity if you move out of this fear zone to the learning zone 
please do not get stuck there start moving away from the learning zone to the growth zone use this an opportunity as an opportunity of your growth <coughs> This is something that I want to share with you. It will not take much time. Uh, these are some of the sites that are available with NCRT. They have taken the Stay Safe from Coronavirus COVID-19 initiative. We have the Eparshala, we have the NROER, we have the Diksha, we have the Nishta, we have the NCRT textbooks, the ICT curriculum, the accessibility in school, the cyber safety. I thought I might share this only with you. You can visit them. The Eparshala application, the Diksha, the ARVR, the SOYAM, the NISHTA, and the EPARTSHALA, these are applications from which you can draw a lot of material. Lesson plans, no. teacher training modules. <clears throat> Give me a little water. These modules are available and you can download them. Uh, the learning outcomes, four books, two are these, and these are the other two, upper primary and primary, and now we have the secondary, the elementary, and the secondary. Please download them and go through them. We have gone through them and then only prepared this presentation. Uh, we read this Helen Locke's paper on reopening of schools, the strategy and implementation, a wonderful document. We read the guidance about reopening of schools coming from UNICEF. We studied from, again another paper which came from UNICEF and World Bank. It was framework for reopening of schools. Uh, these are some of the references which we consulted. The World Health Organization has come out with a small booklet, Doing What Matters in Times of Stress, an illustrated guide. Our own Quality Council of India uh, and one of its subsidiaries known as NAPA. Sir, you please take some water and then give some pause, sir. Uh, no worry, Beta. No worry. Thank you, Beta. Thank you. God bless you. National Accreditation Board for Education and Training, we call it, it's the NABIT. They have also built some materials, which are quality materials, I must tell you. And this also may be studied. These are NCRT, some syllabi and books and answer sheets available for the children, wherever you need to help them. Then we have this paper, Catalyzing Transformational Change in School Education. I found it very useful. Uh, this came from... I mean, the United States, USA, states and US, that was the basic thing. If I go back as a teacher who is very fond of teaching in the, uh, not in the online mode, but in the face-to-face -face mode, I would say that we started with facing the challenge. We said that it has four main factors, the infrastructure. Sir, there is somebody waiting. If you could remove him, enter, ask him to enter the waiting room, allow him. Or should I allow him? I'll allow him, sir. So we have, my God, that brings the whole block in front of me. We did discuss the infrastructure and its various aspects like transportation and trans corridors, classroom seating, eye contact area, then health and hygiene. We did discuss the toilet hygiene, the drinking water, the food hygiene, the medical surveillance and the sanitization in teaching and learning, assembly activities, blended learning and education continuity plan, social and emotional learning, assessment and PTM, and in surveillance, we did talk of surveillance by the teacher, surveillance by the principal, surveillance by the doctor. And that brings me to the end of this presentation almost, but there is something that I would like you to watch. I have time, two to three minutes. It doesn't matter if we overshoot it by a couple of minutes. Sir, is the sound audible? Uh, Aurora, Good sir. Audible, sir, it's all audible. Good yes. Good मुश्किल बहुत है, मगर वक्त ही तो है। गुजर जाएगा, गुजर जाएगा। जिंदा रहने का ये जो जज्बा है, फिर उभर आएगा, गुजर जाएगा, गुजर जाएगा। माना मौत चेहरा बदल कर आई है, माना मौत चेहरा बदल कर आई है। माना रात काली है, भयावह है, गहराई है। लोग दरवाजों पे रस्तों पे रुके बैठे हैं। लोग दरवाजों पे रस्तों पे रुके बैठे हैं। कई घबराए हैं, सहमे हैं, छिपे बैठे हैं। मगर यकीन रख, मगर 
یقین رکھ یہ بس لمحہ ہے دو پل میں بکھر جائے گا زندہ رہنے کا یہ جو جذبہ ہے پھر اثر لائے گا مشکل بہت ہے مگر وقت ہی تو ہے گزر جائے گا گزر جائے گا I'm not afraid. 
sure i need your 5 minutes more <clears throat> i need your 5 minutes and i would request you in case somebody is in a hurry we won't stop him i am stopping the recording first i am stopping sharing and then i am stopping recording